In 1982, I wrote a book called The Complete Metalsmith. The idea was to create a practical benchside reference that would meet my needs as a working jeweler. Recently, it seemed like the time might be right to try it in video. I think the popularity of that book had to do with its accuracy, thoroughness, and the common sense way in which it was organized. All those ingredients are in this tape. We've tried to put together a presentation that is comprehensive and fast-paced without making it too ponderous. For organization, I got to thinking about materials. Copper, brass, sterling, gold. Traditionally, this is the stuff of jewelry making. As I wondered about the things we do to it, that seemed to present itself as an obvious chapter division. So what can we do to it? The metal can be cut, the pieces can be joined, the elements can be given volume through forming methods. A variety of techniques can alter the surface. All these procedures are used to build a piece of jewelry. At the beginning of each section, you'll see a screen like this. Each chapter is color-coded with a flag that will move down the right side of your screen as we proceed. In addition, at the end, you'll find an appendix in which I make a few pieces from start to finish. I think this is important because it synthesizes the little bits and pieces of instruction that are covered earlier on. A word about video. Sitting there at home, watching TV, you have a power you wouldn't have if you were here in the studio with me. That power is concentrated in a single finger, the finger that pushes the buttons. Hey, can you imagine that? About 20 years ago, VHS technology was brand new and we had to talk about it. Now I want to talk about today's brand new technology. We're shooting now on DVD. In addition to a better picture, this gives us a few advantages. You can jump quickly from track to track. Of course, you can pause, fast forward, go back. And in addition to watching on your TV, you can use your laptop. Okay, back to the past. So I hope you enjoy the tape. I'd like to hear from you. Please feel free to write to me, care of the Brookfield Craft Center. Before we get started, I'd like to say a word about safety. Nothing I'm going to be showing you is inherently dangerous, but there's always an element of risk. It's absolutely vital that you understand the techniques, the tools, and the chemicals that you're working with. Remember to protect your eyes whenever using power equipment, such as when drilling, buffing, or grinding. Wraparound goggles should also be worn to protect against splashing whenever you're using strong chemicals. The dusts created in buffing, grinding, and mixing investment are dangerous to breathe. At the very least, use a paper mask to block these out. Far better, use a properly fitting soft rubber mask equipped with the appropriate filters and canisters. These can filter out both dusts and vapors. Keep the mask in a sealed plastic bag when not in use and replace filters when the draw feels restricted. Protect your hearing by using any of the several styles of earplugs shown here. This is especially important when working with the protracted noise of motors or the ringing sounds of hammering. When mixing or working with strong chemicals, wear protective clothing to minimize exposed skin surface. Never wear loose clothing like scarves and ties and always keep long hair pinned up when in the studio. Never eat or smoke in the studio. The traces of compounds on your fingers are likely to be ingested. Throughout the program, we'll use these safety alert symbols to indicate procedures which require particular attention to safety. As a pendant, this leaves something to be desired. Clearly, I'm going to have to cut it. I could use scissors or heavy shears like these, but they're only appropriate for squares and rectangles. Far more versatile is the jeweler's saw frame. Sawing is one of the most basic and at the same time most versatile techniques in the jeweler's bag of tricks. One of the things I like about it is that it requires only very simple pieces of equipment. We'll start with the saw frame. They all look basically alike. They have a set screw at each end and another adjustment screw up here. The principal difference between one frame and another is the size or depth, and that refers to the distance from the saw blade back here. This one, for instance, is a two-inch saw. This is a four-and-a-half-inch saw. 
The reason you might need a large one like this is because it's this distance that determines how far you can cut into a piece of metal. Most jewelry work uses a small saw frame. Another important piece of equipment is the saw blade itself. This is a very small, precision piece of hardened steel. In this case, I'm using a small size, and there are a dozen of them here, so you can see they're quite fragile. The size of the saw blade is determined by the thickness of the metal on which you're working. The third, and in some ways most important, component in the sawing process is this piece of wood that sticks out of the bench toward me, called the bench pin. Jewelry making differs from most activities in that you don't work on a table so much as you work in front of it. The active zone here is this space. This, the bench pin, as it projects out, provides my point of reference and my single point of contact. First step in proper sawing is to get the blade well attached into the frame. When you look at a blade, if you look up close, you can see that the teeth have a certain direction. The teeth should always point toward the handle. If you can't see it, you can also test this by rubbing on fabric. You'll find the teeth will grab in one direction and not in the other. So the first step is to lay the blade into the frame and attach it at one end. I'll then adjust the length so that the end of the blade just reaches the gripping plate. And at that point, I'll tighten the frame. Now, using a good deal of force, I'll lean against the frame and I will squeeze it together. And when it's in that squeezed or closed position, I'll then grip the blade behind the plate and make it finger tight. When the blade is properly gripped, you can ping it with a fingernail and it should make a high-pitched noise like that. If you get a dull thud or ponging sound, you should stop and retighten the blade before you try to saw. The sawing process itself should be relaxed, soothing. It's a gentle process. And that might um, sound peculiar when you first start out because there's a tendency to kind of clutch and jerk at it. But if you persevere, you'll find it can be very smooth and lyrical. There are a few steps or key points to keep in mind and I'll list them as if they are hard and fast rules. In fact, what's most important is, is that you get a smooth, natural combination of all these factors happening at once. The first step is what we've just talked about, that the blade must be tight. The second is that you should position yourself in front of the bench so that your shoulder is lined up with the bench pin. Don't sit down at the bench pin as if it was your dinner plate. Instead, you'll sit off to the side, since I'm right-handed I'll actually sit to the left of the pin so that my working shoulder is in line. The result of that is a more relaxed arm muscle. Also, as part of that, I'll adjust my height. If you're sitting up too high, you'll find you have a cramp right here in your wrist, and that makes the process painful and tedious and, and usually will result with broken blades. Instead, you'll sit down low. The next step requires that the metal be well supported. This is where the bench pin comes in handy. Jewelers tend to personalize their bench pins. I like this keyhole design, which gives me a round working area, but you can cut it to any shape you like. The advantage here is that I can work on metal that is well supported on both sides. You'll notice that with my left hand here, I'll reach around the metal and hold it on both edges. Because the bench pin is flat, I can swivel and pivot as necessary. Another important point is that the blade should remain vertical all the time. The proper stroke is going to be like this, a steady, smooth, up and down stroke. You want to avoid working at an angle like this, and also avoid the tendency to rock like that. And finally, and I would say most importantly, the hand holding the saw frame should be extremely relaxed. In fact, to say that it's holding is an overstatement. Cradling is probably a better term. The frame is just barely supported in my grip. You put all that together, and it looks like this.
Once you've learned how to control the saw blade, it's important that you make a line that you can see well and that's relatively permanent. There are a couple ways to do it. One possibility is this material, a commercial dye, comes in this jar with an applicator brush and dries very quickly. Another version that achieves the same result is white shoe polish. Or the method that I like uses label making stock. This is a sticky backed paper. Uh, one brand name is Crack and Peel, for instance. You can buy this at office supply stores or quick copy houses. I like this because it's a real paper surface, holds pencil well, and can be erased. That's what I've used for the example. There are a number of times when you might want to saw out two identical pieces. A good way to do that is to use tabs to lock the two pieces together. <laughs> After making those four cuts in both pieces of metal, I'll now separate them and complete the V in one unit. And either one could be used. I'll use the top unit. Now, having cut out these triangular pieces, I'll put the sections back together. and with pliers, fold up the tabs in the lower unit. These are then pressed down. And that will hold the two pieces from slipping in any direction while I do the piercing. After the interior cuts are made, then I'll cut away the, out the outside and clean up the final project. The next step is to drill a hole in each one of these sections. In order to locate the hole, I'll start by center punching. The effect here is to make a little dimple in the surface of the metal. It doesn't have to be deep. This tiny crater will prevent the drill bit from wandering. The hole can be drilled with a hand drill or, more typically, with a flexible shaft machine. The flexible shaft machine, or flex shaft, is a popular and versatile tool. Its small precision motor is generally operated through a foot rheostat, like those used with sewing machines. The harder you push the pedal, the faster the motor turns, usually going at about 14,000 RPM at top speed. The flex shaft is used for drilling, grinding, carving, and polishing. Goggles should always be worn when using this machine. When sawing an interior area, in a process called piercing, I first loosen the blade and thread the object onto it. Then the blade is tightened as before. To remove, the blade is released from the gripping plate below, and the process is repeated. Interior spaces are cut first, and then the metal around the pieces are sawn away, except where the tabs are holding. As a final step, I'll cut off the tabs.
Even if this was going to be a pin, I'd have to find some way to attach a finding to the back. There are two approaches to this, one way that uses heat and one that doesn't. Every once in a while, it's possible to make a piece of jewelry out of a single piece of metal. But far more typical is the case where you join two or three or sometimes dozens of pieces together. There is a family of connections called cold connections, which is not what happens when you put your tongue on the flagpole in winter, but rather cases where pieces of metal are mechanically wrapped over one another that in ways that do not involve the heat of soldering. I'm going to show some standard devices in this family of cold connections. But before we get to that, I want to make the point that cold connections are all around us. By looking around, you'll find many examples that can be adapted to your work as a jeweler. For instance, here. A typical example, and the most familiar one to all of us, is the paper clip. Another familiar example is the staple. Here's a case where this potato peeler is held together without a soldered joint. Right here, the metal curls over and wraps onto itself. It makes a surprisingly strong joint. This um, can opener is held together with a rivet at this end and a tube rivet at this end. Examples of cold connections can turn up where you least expect them. For instance, the mechanism inside this toy is held together with tabs, which, like fingers, reach through holes and press down on the top plate to hold it all together. As basic as they are, tabs present an opportunity for design enri enrichment as well. In this case, for instance, I want to hold a piece of copper onto a piece of brass, and I'm going to use tabs which will become a part of the design. For this piece, I've cut out triangular tabs and bent them up at a 90 degree angle. In this copper unit, I have corresponding slots so that the two, if I've measured correctly, will slide together like that. I'll then set the piece onto the bench anvil and press the tab over, the intention being just to take it away from vertical, and then with a rawhide mallet, tap it on. Like that. The idea of a rivet is really very simple. It's kind of like a nail with a head on both ends. A rivet, by definition, is a rod or a length of material that goes through sections and then is upset or bulged over on both the top and the bottom. And that makes the clamping action that holds it together. I'm going to do a standard rivet here. Any piece of metal can become a rivet. In this case, I'm using a piece of wire that goes through holes that I've already drilled in these two pieces of copper and brass. It's critical that the wire make a very snug fit as it goes through. If the wire is so small that it wiggles in the hole like this, it won't make a sound rivet. A wire of the correct diameter fills the hole completely. And now I will snip that. And then file it. The snippers always leave a pointed end. And we don't want that. So I'll file it off till it's square. And at this point, I'm also paying particular attention to the length of the rivet. The idea is to have half the diameter of the wire projecting on each side. In other words, if you were using a wire a millimeter in diameter, you'd want to have half a millimeter of metal extending out here and half a millimeter extending in that direction. I'll be working on the surface plate or bench anvil, which is a small piece of polished steel. And I'll be using a riveting hammer. This is a small cross-peen hammer. Cross-peen refers to this wedge-shaped end. That allows me to control the direction in which the metal will move when it's hit. I want to be careful that I don't press it all the way down. That leaves too much rivet showing on this side and nothing on the underside. Instead, I'll raise the workpiece so it's hovering above the bench plate, allowing a little bit of the rivet to project below and a little bit above. 
I'll then strike it with the cross bean hammer. Obviously force is not necessary. This hammer, though it looks like a toy, is a very effective tool. It's marksmanship that counts. As I strike, the round wire is changed in shape and becomes an oval. The next step is to turn the whole assembly 90 degrees and hit crossway to what I was doing before. So you might think of it as making an X on the top of the wire. Again, this process is called upsetting. That word refers to the activity of pressing metal down on itself. Having created that upset head or the mushroom head on one side, I'll now flip it all over and repeat the process. Typically, rivets or other cold connections are done late in the process. Here, of course, I'm just working on sample pieces, but if I was making a finished piece of jewelry, I would have probably worked these pieces all the way through the conclusion. That is, stones would be set, the patina, the color would be in place, the edges would be smooth, and so on. That's usually done because it's easier to work on the pieces when they're separate than it is after they're assembled. Because the piece is nearing completion, it's a good idea to avoid extraneous hammer marks, which will be scars that have to be worked off later with sandpaper or polishing. And I do that by anchoring my hand out here. Rather than have my hand free to move around, it's pivoting. My, the heel of my hand is resting on the bench so that this becomes a very robotic, machine-like activity here. Once the rivet has been properly pressed down and the two pieces of metal are well joined, then I'll flip the hammer over and use this flat face. That has the effect of smoothing out the little lines that are left by the cross pin end of the hammer. The rivet can also be finished by polishing or shaping with a beading tool. Now you'll notice in this case that I've drilled additional holes in the copper, but not yet in the brass. First thing to notice is that you always have to have more than one rivet, because one rivet will still allow the pieces to rotate, unless, of course, that's what you want. It would be tempting, then, to originally hold the pieces together and drill a bunch of holes. Not a good idea. Even when you try to be very careful, it seems inevitable that somewhere in the process, between the second and third hole or the fifth and the sixth, somewhere, the two pieces slide a little bit, and all it takes is a little bit to throw you off. The effect then is you get one or two rivets in position, and when you go to put in that next one, the holes don't line up, and uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation from which to recover. So instead, I'll drill as many holes as I want in one piece and a single hole in the bottom sheet. A rivet here still allows the top to rotate. I'll drill a second hole opposite the first, and form a rivet there. Now the pieces are locked in position and the rest of the holes can be drilled. It's hard to overestimate the value of rivets. Not only can they be used to join pieces of metal without the introduction of heat, but they're handy for cases where heat is not an option. For instance, when you're attaching wood or shell or stone. What I've demonstrated is a very straightforward and usual case, two flat pieces being joined. But a lot of times you'll have to come up with a particular situation because of the shapes with which you're working. Here's an example. In this case, I fabricated a cap out of sterling, which I'm joining onto a leather strap for a necklace end. And I want to put a rivet right down through here. But it's impossible for me to set this down on a flat surface because of the two wire bands on either end of the cap. If I strike it here, there's no resistance beneath, and hence there will be no rivet head. In a case like this, I have first drilled a, a hole and fed a wire through it, and then I've gripped a stamping tool here in the vise to serve as a temporary anvil. You can see when I set this down that the rivet head is in contact with the anvil. From here, riveting proceeds as usual. Another variation on rivets is the tube rivet. 
In that case, a length of tubing is substituted for the solid rod and used to join pieces of metal together. An advantage of the tube rivet is the fact that it takes less stress to curl the edges over. For that reason, it's recommended for delicate situations, as in the setting of an enamel or a shell. Another advantage of the tube rivet is that there's a perforation that runs through the join. This can be used to attach a moving part, or, for instance, as in this can opener, it makes a nice place for a thong. The making of a tube rivet exactly parallels the standard rivet that we looked at earlier. A length of tubing is sawn off. Again, it should project about a half a diameter on either side of the sheet. It's then laid into position, centered, and instead of hammering, any sharp tool like this scribe can be used to begin the curling over process. The scribe is laid gently into the tube and rotated like this, which has the effect of curling it outward. After one side is started, you flip it over and work on the other side. And you'll need to go back and forth three or four times anyway. You'll be able to see the edge as it curls outward and grips the two pieces of metal together. I'll then use a hammer to finish off the joint and set the rivet in its final position. The tube rivet is finished by pinching it between a pair of dapping punches like this. A light tap is all that's needed. Whether you work in large scale or small scale with precious metals or base metals, I think you'll find lots of uses for cold connections. At the same time, a lot of jewelry making involves soldering, and sooner or later you're going to have to learn how to control it. So that's where we should turn our attention next. Silver soldering like that is perhaps the single most important technique a jeweler can learn. That kind of joint, one in which solder is flowed into the structure of the material, combines the delicate handling necessary for the jewelry scale with tremendous strength. The joint that I just made is in fact as strong as the parent metal. Metals are made up of crystals, and it helps me to understand what's going on on the crystalline level. Metal is made up of a geometric lattice of crystals, represented here by cubes. When heat is applied, the crystals move apart, creating microscopic spaces. If the metal is heated to its melting point, the crystals have moved so far apart that the bonds holding them are broken. In soldering, we use a material formulated to be fluid within the temperature range where there is a space between the crystals. In the soldering process, the metal is heated until the solder melts and is then drawn into the spaces between the crystals by capillary action. Proper soldering requires that the metal be perfectly clean and that the pieces be fitted so that there are no gaps. The soldering process requires the interaction of three factors, flux, solder, and a heat source. When metal is heated, it tends to combine with oxygen, forming metallic oxides. These are gray films which prohibit the free flow of solder. Flux is a chemical that absorbs oxygen before it has a chance to combine with the metal. What I've been using here is a white paste flux, but there are other options you should be aware of. Another paste flux that lends itself to base metals because it's very heavy duty, does a good job of absorbing oxygen, is a black variety. The other side of the family are liquid fluxes. These have the advantage of application. They can be brushed on, you can dip the piece into them, or they can be put into a spray jar like this and spritzed onto the piece throughout the soldering operation. To make solder, the parent metal is mixed with small amounts of other metals in specific proportions to determine the flow point of the alloy. Zinc and copper are added to silver to create these three commonly used grades of silver solder. The range of torches available can be overwhelming to a newcomer to jewelry making, but they fall into two categories. Some torches, like this one, use atmospheric air combined with a fuel. In this case, the fuel is propane. Another popular version is the torch I'm using here, called a prestolite, or acetylene atmosphere torch. The other family uses bottled oxygen to increase the temperatures available, while simultaneously allowing for a smaller flame. 
Again, several gases may be used. Oxygen torches are especially handy for small work and repairs. Any torch can produce three types of flame. In a neutral flame like this, the amount of fuel is matched by the available oxygen, resulting in complete combustion. The fuel-rich reducing flame is used to prevent oxidation. The pale, violet-colored oxidizing flame should generally be available. The torch is one of the basic tools in a jewelry studio, and its use should be thoroughly understood. If you're not comfortable with the operation of your torch, consult a welding supply company for help. Check the threaded fittings for leaks by brushing them with soapy water. Tanks should be secured in a stable, upright position. Keep paper towels and other combustibles away from the soldering area. When you're finished for the day, close the valves and bleed the hoses. Let's watch the process again. I'll apply flux and then lay the solder chips so that they span the joint. The flux uses water as a vehicle to create a consistency that can be brushed. And the first step is to evaporate that water away. You'll notice that I keep the torch well above the metal. If I come in too fast, too soon, the rapid boiling of the water will throw the solder chips away, and I'll have to reposition them. When the flux has been converted to a white scale, I can lower the torch. The torch I'm using here is a Prestolite. Another chemical that's part of the soldering process is called pickle. This is a granular substance that's mixed with water and kept warm at the bench side. During the soldering operation, the metal is covered with oxide film and a flux residue called flux glass. Either of these can be removed by abrasion, but that process is at best tedious and also wasteful of the material. Instead, we'll drop the piece into the pickle, and if the pickle is fresh and warm, after a couple minutes, both of these surfaces will be removed. When pulling the piece out of the pickle, I'll give it a quick dip in water. And here you can see a piece immediately after soldering and what it looks like when it comes out of the pickle. The black surface is the oxide film, and the green is the flux residue. There's a lot to soldering, and because it's a fundamental part of jewelry making, let's review. The metal should be clean and the parts well fitted. Remember to apply flux. Place the solder so that it touches both pieces being joined. Start with the torch high, and evaporate the liquid in the flux. If the chips move, slide them back. Heat all parts so that they reach soldering temperature at the same time. And when you're finished, clean the work in pickle. Because of its control, soldering is used for most jewelry applications, but there's another way to join metal with heat called fusing. In that case, the metal is heated to the point where its skin begins to melt. When it becomes fluid, the surfaces of all the pieces involved flow together, co-mingle, and make a strong joint. The result is usually rounded edges and an interesting texture. First step is to apply flux. In this case, I don't have to start off slow because I don't have to worry about solder chips flying around. Remember, there's no solder being used here. What I'm particularly paying attention to is that all the pieces reach the same temperature at the same time. My indicator for this is color. Now I start to see a red color, and I'm going to focus on one area of the piece. You see the way it turns silvery there. That means the skin has become molten. And right at that point, right there in the corner, 
fusion has taken place. In this area, these two pieces are now joined. Now I'll move up and do this joint. That's now been done. That's been done. I could stop now. At this point, the metal is still intact. It looks just like it did before. Usually with fusion, though, I want to go a little further because I'm doing this for the effect of textures and irregular edges. I'll create this by making the metal molten and then removing the heat. This heat and chill reaction causes the metal to buckle and creates a surface texture, uh, which I might call orange peel. I continue heating and cooling until I get the look I want. After fusing, the piece is cleaned in pickle. So, that's an overview of the most common ways of joining metal. Cold connections, such as tabs and rivets, and the use of heat for soldering and fusion. If I can't make a pin out of this, maybe I'll try this. Wire can be bent and shaped with a hammer. So far we've been talking about sheet metal, but of course jewelry is made of wire too. You can buy wire in a range of sizes, but it's nice to be able to make what you need just when you need it. The equipment for this is very simple. It consists of a draw plate, a piece of hardened steel perforated with a series of holes of decreasing size. Each hole is tapered, being smaller at the front, slightly larger at the back, funnel shaped. The draw plate is clamped into a vise and the wire is pulled through each successive hole. In this case, we'll be making round wire. With a different draw plate, it would be possible to make half round or square or wire of any other cross section. The first step is to file the taper on the end of the wire so that it will fit through a hole smaller than the existing diameter. wire is fed into a hole where it makes a snug fit and pulled through with these heavy-duty pliers called draw tongs. You'll notice that the handle is curled to increase grip and the jaws are coarsely serrated. The wire is pulled through with slow, even strokes. You'll notice several things happening. Perhaps the most obvious is that the wire is getting longer. This is because it's getting smaller, and of course no material is being lost. You might also see that it's shiny. This is the result of a burnishing action of the steel plate on the wire. The other factor that is maybe less obvious is that the wire is becoming work hardened. The stresses of compaction are causing a tension at the crystalline level. There will come a time, if I continue drawing, when the wire, rather than pull through, will snap off. That means the wire has reached its limits of malleability. And before I can continue, I'll need to anneal it. To anneal the wire, I'll heat it up to about two-thirds its melting point. Annealing wire is a little tricky because the mass is large, but each individual thread is delicate and easily melted. You'll notice that I secured the coil by wrapping the ends of the wire around. I'd either do this or wrap it with a piece of fine wire, preferably copper or stainless steel. And my selection has to do with the fact that I want to go from here directly into the pickle. If you were to use binding wire, you'd want to be sure to unwrap the binding wire before putting it into the hot pickle, or else the metal would become copper plated. At 
this point, the metal is smaller than it was before, still shiny, and considerably more malleable. Remember, if you're going to continue drawing, be sure that the wire is carefully dried. The draw plate is made of steel and will rust if exposed to moisture. An interesting way to give unique shape to wire is with the use of a swage. This is a piece of tool steel that I've shaped with saw and file and then polished, hardened, and tempered. I'll grip it in the vise. Lay a piece of annealed wire in the groove and strike it with a planishing hammer. As simple as it is, even bending wire has a few do's and don'ts. Don't, for instance, use sharp tools that will put scars and gashes in the wire. Don't use pliers that have serrated jaws. The best tools are your hands. They're soft and squishy and won't leave any marks on the wire. And of course, they have infinite control. There are times, however, when they're just not strong enough, and you'll need to turn to the leverage of pliers. Small curves are bent with the round nose pliers. For larger curves, we use ring forming pliers. Here we have one flat jaw and one half round jaw. The curved jaw is put on the inside of the curl. The flat jaw touches only at the tangent. To make a square bend or straighten out a curve, I use square nose pliers. Sometimes a small pinch is all that's needed. For cutting, you can use wire cutters or a more delicate straight end cutter that leaves a nicer looking end. or toenail clippers. One of the familiar uses of wire is as jump rings. These are small rings that make a bridge or jump from one element to another. For instance, from a pendant to a necklace, or from one link of a chain to another. It's possible to buy jump rings, but most hand craftsmen make their own as they're needed process could hardly be more simple. I'm wrapping a piece of wire around, in this case, a wooden dowel. Other mandrels would include nails, knitting needles, or pieces of wire. Some people like to saw the rings while they're still on the mandrel. I usually prefer to slide it off. The cut-off rings are allowed to drop into the sweeps drawer, where they can be easily retrieved. Forging, the process of shaping metal with a hammer, requires annealed metal, a hammer, and a solid work surface. I'm working here on a large anvil, which has the advantage of stability because of its weight. Many metalsmiths, however, use a piece of railroad track or a similar block of steel. Hammers are available in a boggling array of sizes and styles. It might be easier to understand if we think in terms of families. Mallets are used to bend metal without thinning it. They can be made of rawhide like this one, or wood, rubber, or plastic. One face on the planishing hammer is perfectly flat and the other is slightly domed. Both faces are mirror polished. The planishing hammer is used to smooth out the surface of metal. In speaking of hammers, we refer to the face and the peen or back end. This one is a ball peen hammer. The one I'll be using for forging is called a cross peen. We saw this shape before in the riveting hammer. A lot of the character of forging comes from a plane change like this, where it goes from vertical to horizontal. I'm going to make one of those now. 
I'll use the cross pin running across the axis of the copper that will squeeze the metal that way. There's no directional force coming this direction or this direction, so all the metal that's there is being pushed that way or that way. To minimize rolled over edge, I strike as close to the center as possible, and I'll work from both sides. And before the grooves get too deeply pushed down, I'll flip the hammer and smooth them out with the flat face of the hammer. What makes this shape so appealing is that a surface becomes an edge. And by the time you're there, you realize that you're in the middle of another form over here. So there's this kind of hypnotic blending of this element, which overlaps or splices into this element. To achieve that, I've hammered about two-thirds of the way up the rod. Now I'll flip it over and do the same kind of hammering and run from here down to about here. Final finishing can then be done on the horn of the anvil. Earlier we saw the way to file a point on wire. When using heavy stock, making a taper is best done with a hammer. The logic is pretty simple. I'll start up here and strike a series of blows with the cross pin across the axis of the wire. After going all the way to the end, I'll come back, but not quite as far up the length as I did before, and repeat the process, each time working on all four sides. The next time, I'll only come up to here and then hammer that down. That means that a point here would be struck once, just on the first pass. A point, say, down here would be struck maybe five or six times, once on each successive pass. Because it's been hit more times, this area is smaller, and the result is a taper. You'll notice that it's going to grow in length. Uh, this sample was the same size as this before I started. very important that the wire be kept straight all the time. You see it has a little curve, so before I continue I'll straighten that curve out. That's four sides all starting up here. Now I'm going to start about here. I'm working on copper, which is an extremely malleable metal, but even copper gets work hardened with this much stress. It's about time for me to stop and anneal it now. If I continue, not only is the work getting harder, but the edges are starting to crack. You might just begin to see it here. After annealing, remember to dry the piece thoroughly so you don't get any water on the anvil. As I get down to this thinner section, I need to use lighter blows. If I were to strike as strongly as I was at the beginning, I could possibly pinch right through. That certainly makes the stock so rectangular, hitting it real hard here, that it would be hard to recover on this side. When the objective is a round taper, I go at it the same way by first creating a square and drawing the taper while it's square, and then turn it on an axis like that and strike down on the corner. Of course, what you're doing is flattening the corner you can see and also the corner directly opposite it. Flip it 90 degrees and hit the other two edges. The result of this is an octagonal section, and from here the piece can be simply turned and planished. All the work on a graceful piece like this one has been done with a hammer. 
And that's the idea of forging. Maybe this would work better as a pin if I put some pattern on it. I could use a hammer and punch. Probably the most direct way to texture metal is to strike it. In this example, assorted ball-peen hammers have been used. Here, a textured hammer face leaves its mark. A cross-peen offers many possibilities. Here I've used a scribe. Patterns can be found all around us. This texture was achieved by pounding the metal onto concrete and here by pounding onto cast iron. Another embellishment technique uses the rolling mill. The idea behind roll printing is really very basic. We're going to take a soft material, I'll demonstrate with a piece of clay, and any textured surface, here I'll use some sanding film. Some kind of pressure is used to push these together, and when they're peeled apart, the texture has been imprinted or transferred onto the softer material. For our purposes, the source of the pressure will be the rolling mill. The rolling mill is a precise and expensive piece of equipment. Its primary use is to thin sheet metal, but it can also be used in patterning and in the reduction of wire. The rollers are of polished steel and require special care to remain smooth and parallel. They should be protected from moisture when not in use. Hardened steel should never come into contact with the rollers because it will scar them and knock them out of true. Let me illustrate this way. I'm going to take a piece of annealed sterling and some nylon gauze. The idea is to get this texture pressed into the sterling. Now I could shove it through the rolling mill like this and it would work. It would also do a number on the rollers. To prevent that, I'm going to protect them by adding to the sandwich this piece of brass. I choose brass because it's considerably tougher than sterling. In this way, all the push is going to be going into the sterling, making a clearer and therefore darker impression. I can set this in either side up. It doesn't make any difference in the result. Now I'll send this through and adjust the tension by trial and error until I get it where it's difficult to roll through, but doesn't require two people. You can see that the gauze, for one thing, has been pressed and can't be used again. The brass has very little surface texture, and the sterling has a nice, deep pattern etched into it. It shows up pretty well now. If I were to oxidize it, it would be even more highly contrasted. Let's see another example. In this case, I've got a template, which I've made by piercing a sheet of brass. I'll be using polished sterling, which is, of course, annealed, and regular Kleenex. Sandwich goes together like before. And there's the template, the paper, which is heavily stressed. And look at that. What you'll see is that the polished sterling was able to remain polished where it crossed over the star. In other words, there was nothing pressing on it when it was in that open spot. In between the stars, the paper was pressed into the sterling, and it gives this wonderful, rich, sandblasted look. You can buy commercial stamps, but the selection is somewhat limited. I think it's a good idea to know how to make your own. I'm going to make a stamp that will create this arrow image. The starting point is a piece of tool steel. First I'll file the top end or striking end of the tool, like this. Next I'll thin the bottom end, the part where the image will be. 
It's important that this is smooth and exactly perpendicular to the shank. I'll test it by making it stand up. After refining with sandpaper, I'll touch it with a bit of dye and then draw the image on. The shape is then achieved through the use of a saw and files. I'll use a lump of clay to check the tool. It's worth taking time to make sure you get the image just right, because when properly heat treated, this tool is going to last for generations. In order to convert this soft steel into hardened steel, we use a specific heat treatment called hardening and tempering. The two words refer to two steps of an operation and really should be used both together, but sometimes for shortcuts we talk about hardening or tempering. In fact, you never do one without the other. The first step, hardening, involves heating the steel until it goes through a critical change. Its crystalline structure will convert from one shape to another shape. The, the new shape is much tougher than the first. In order to freeze the action at that point, we need to have a controlled cool down or quenching. If it cools too rapidly, there are stresses developed which will cause the tool to crack. If it cools too slowly, it will convert from one phase back to its other, from the hard back to the soft. So we need to find some material that will draw the heat away pretty fast, but not too fast. And the material we use for that is oil. This steel is called an oil hardening steel. It's been formulated specifically to work with quenching oil. Now, commercially, they get very complicated about this using oils of specific viscosity heated up to um, a specific temperature. In our case, we don't need to be quite that critical. I'm using motor oil at room temperature. I'll be hardening just the bottom inch or so of the tool. My indicator is color. I'll be heating until it's a bright, luminous red. Another indicator, if you're uh, not confident about reading color, is the fact that the steel, when it reaches critical change, when it goes through that phase change, loses, loses its magnetism. So you can keep a magnet close at hand and just touch the, the tool to it. And if it does not pick up the magnet, you'll know it's at the right temperature. That's approaching the right color. And now I'm going to very quickly move over to the oil and stir with the tool. The stirring is important. If I plunge this, the tool in without stirring, it's immediately surrounded by an envelope of hot oil, and that defeats the purpose. By stirring, I'm constantly bringing it into contact with fresh, cool oil. I'll keep it there until it has cooled sufficiently to hold. Clean it off, and then check it. At this point, the steel should be very hard. It's also brittle. But let's deal with the hardness first. I'll rub a file against it. This is the same file that a minute ago was used to shape the tool. Now, the file will not cut in. There's a high-pitched, glassy sound. Compare that sound. With that. This is the back end, not been hardened. This is the tool end. You can hear the difference. If it did not have that sound, I'd repeat the process I just went through. Something to be careful about is heating it to the right color, but then taking too long to get it over to the oil. As I said, at this point, the steel 
is very hard but brittle, so brittle that if I was to strike it, chances are it would shatter. This is disappointing since I could spend so long making the tool, it would also be dangerous. In order to relieve that brittleness, I'll go through a second operation called tempering. The tempering operates at about a third the temperatures that we just saw. In order to read the correct temperatures, I need to clear the metal. It has a, a gray scale. And I'm going to get rid of that with sandpaper. The hardening process that went to bright red operates at about, well, a little over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The tempering that we're about to go into operates between 400 and 600 degrees. For that reason, you'll want to use a small torch, a gentle flame, and go slow. I think if there's a single common problem, it's in running right through this process and missing it because it happens like that. Last time I moved the flame around, this time I'm going to keep it constant, about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half away from the tip. Nothing's going to happen for a few seconds, and then you're going to see a rainbow of color. There it is. You'll see blue in the center. Next to it is plum, followed by brown, followed by a straw or bronzy yellow. It's that bronzy yellow that I'm going to watch. As I keep the torch here, that color is going to crawl toward the tip. It's also crawling up the handle, but I'm not too worried about that. I'm watching the one that's going toward the tip. And when the straw gets to the tip, then again, moving quickly, I'll quench the tool. Now, the, the yellow itself doesn't mean anything. It's the fact that it indicates a certain temperature. At that temperature, there are changes going on inside the steel that relieve the brittleness without sacrificing hardness. If I were to wait too long, or the longer I wait, the more sacrifice there is. That is, the greater flexibility, but the less hardness. And there you can see we've got yellow on the tip, which is maximum hardness, but enough flexibility to make an impact tool like this. Behind that is brown, then plum, then blue. If I had continued heating a little bit further, those colors would have advanced to the tip. The plum and the blue have the most flexibility, but at the greatest expense in hardness. The most common chemical for darkening sterling involves the use of a chemical called liver of sulfur or hydrosulfurated potash. This is familiar to most jewelers as that rotten egg smelling stuff. It's usually sold as a gravel. You mix it up with water. A little goes a long way. The size of a pea uh, is right for, say, a cup of water. I like to use warm water because it dissolves faster. If you drop a piece of sterling into that mix and leave it for two, three, four minutes, it will turn black, or at least a dark gray. But you should know that there are a number of beautiful colors that come along the way. Let me demonstrate those. First color is a golden or bronzy color. It's a little darker, just showing brown, for instance, in that corner. Next, we'll start to see a vermilion, a, a bright red. We're just getting a hint of that in the center. These colors are a result of temperature of the liquid, cleanliness of the metal, and the amount of time that the, chemist, that the liver of sulfur is allowed to remain on the metal. Just beginning to see the color patterns developing up here in the corner. Another very popular surface is verdigris, this chalky green color that's so popular on copper and brass. You can buy green patina liquid ready to use, or you can make your own. To use, set the piece in a warm place and spray until the surface is uniformly wet. Allow the work to air dry. Repeat the process three to six times. This surface is not recommended when the work will be handled or worn. 
Real finishing starts when you first buy your piece of metal. Don't put in any marks you don't want, and you won't have to spend the time later taking them out. That means handle your metal carefully. In storage, put a sheet of paper between pieces, particularly of precious metal. And when you're traveling, don't let it bang around in your toolbox. A file is your first line of defense in removing scratches. The teeth on a file are directional. They point away from the handle. That means that you cut on the push stroke. You'll find your files will last longer if you get into the habit of lifting slightly on the return. When the file gets clogged up, take the time necessary to clean it. You can use a file card or just a piece of copper rubbed this way. We'll pick out the little pieces of metal that are lodged between the teeth. A few minutes spent cleaning the file will actually save you a much longer time using it. After a file, I turn to sandpaper. And I like to wrap my sandpaper around sticks like this. You can cut these yourself, or at the lumber yard, you'll find them sold as lattice. The advantage of having the paper on a stick is that it improves leverage. I can push harder, and that means I can cut deeper and therefore faster. The reason I like this size stick is that it mimics the shape and feel of the file. A typical progression would be to file, and then, without altering the position of my torso, set that down, go right into the sanding stick, and I can move down the progression from coarse to fine grits of paper. And in that way, because I haven't changed position each time or altered my approach to the metal, I get a much more consistent and therefore attractive surface. Remember in sandpapers, the higher numbers are finer papers. You might think of anything in the 100s, that is 120, 140, 160, as being a coarse paper. 200s are medium, 300s are fine, 400 is extra fine, and a 600 paper like this is very fine. I usually follow this with a buffing stick. This is another piece of wood onto which I've glued a little strip of leather. This leather is then treated by rubbing it with a polishing compound, Tripoli or bobbing or white diamond, for instance. And again, the same stroke. And you'd be surprised how effective this can be. Going right through sandpapers all the way to a 600, and then going to this will give a high, bright shine. And then, of course, you'd follow up with a rouge cloth. There are times when you'll need a larger surface, and this is a handy way to deal with that. I've taken a sheet of sandpaper and glued it onto a piece of plexiglass. Masonite also works well. You can use a liquid glue, but spray adhesive is ideal for this. I've put a different grade on each surface, which means with two boards I have four possibilities. These are handy, for instance, when you're leveling a large edge, say the top rim of a cup. You can just spin it around like that. You'll find this paper lasts a long time. You can knock out the dust like that and even take it to the sink and wash it. And uh, it'll, it'll last for months. Let me show you a bright, sparkly finish you can create with a brass brush. I'm going to be working on sterling. And I want to be certain that I don't get this yellow color on the sterling. And I prevent that by using soap. You can either rub a piece of hand soap across it or just dribble on a little bit of liquid soap. Make the brush wet. This is just plain water here. And then scrub the piece. Using a circular motion. And you can see the result is a, is a nice warm glow. I kind of like it better than the the hot shine that plain sterling picks up from rouge. Metal surfaces can be protected by sealing them from the atmosphere. This can be done with a soft substance like wax or a hard sealant such as lacquer. This is the appendix, the section where I make three pieces of jewelry to show you the way the bits of information fit together in a final project. Here I'm bending a bezel to fit a red jasper. After being cut to size and fitted, the joint is dressed with flux, a chip of hard solder is laid on, and the piece is laid onto a brick. The bezel is checked for size, 
and then the bottom edge is trued, fluxed, and set onto a piece of thin sheet metal. Again, hard solder is used. Here I'm cutting off the excess sheet with some snips. The remaining metal is then filed off and the height is adjusted with small scissors. To make the shank of the ring, I've twisted 16 gauge round wire, making two twists, one that runs clockwise and the other counterclockwise. These are laid in between two pieces of plain wire and soldered up. I'm going to finish off the end of the twist with a little jump ring. Half round pliers are used to complete the bending of the shank, which is then trimmed off to accept the bezel. I'll do this work upside down, making certain that I've got the shank well oriented on the bezel so that the oval sits straight on the finger. Here I'm enlarging the bezel slightly, tilting it out so it will accept the stone. The stone is then laid in and the bezel pressed over. To smooth, polish, and toughen the bezel, I'll use a burnisher. In this case, the final polish was achieved with a buffing stick. Next, I'll show the making of a four-prong setting for a faceted stone. In this case, I'll use a round amethyst. The first step looks like I'm making a bezel. In fact, the wire is a little thicker than I'd usually use for a bezel, and the ring is a little smaller. The outside diameter of this ring is the same as the girdle, or the maximum, maximum diameter of the stone. I'll be making prongs out of 16 gauge wire. In each prong I file a point in the end. The point is useful for this step when I'm pressing the prongs into the fire brick. Trim off the excess on the downside and file it smooth. Here I'm soldering on a loop of wire, which in this case will serve as the bail. I'm making a pendant, but this same setting could be used for a ring pin or earrings. The stone is checked for fit and the prongs are snipped off closer to their final height. Then they're shaped, first with a file, then with sandpaper. The stone is laid into position and the prongs are pushed over, either with pliers like this or with a stone setting tool. And next, we'll make a box. The first step is to score the line that will make the fold for each corner. I start with a needle file, then use a large file, and finish up with a square needle file again. 
You know you've gone far enough when the piece can be bent easily in the fingers with the crease showing through on the back side. I scored a single piece and then sawed off what would become the top and the bottom. Now I'll bend each corner and check it against the square. Here you see two L shapes for the top and two others for the base. The corners are joined with hard solder. At each step along the way, the size is checked and double checked. Excess is cut off with a saw. The bottom is slid into the opening of the box and soldered in position. And then the same treatment is done for the top. Here I'm using that piece of roll printed material that you saw made earlier. In this case, I've got the solder on the inside because I don't want to damage the star pattern. Now to make the hinge, I'll prepare a bevel on both the lid and base and further round those out with a needle file so that it will accommodate the small piece of tubing, like that. A tube cutter is used to cut the knuckles for the hinge. This is generally an odd number, here I'll use five. The knuckles are laid into position and because the groove was so carefully measured in the first place, they have no place else to go, so they'll tend to hold themselves in alignment. The piece is heated and the knuckles stay. Excess is then trimmed off. The piece is polished, in this case with a brass brush, and then a snugly fitting hinge pin is slid into position. The ends of the pin are lightly riveted over. Well, that covers the basics. That's all the information we could cram into that little box. But of course, there's so much more to say. And we haven't even talked about design. That's where your personality combines with the foundation that we've laid here to create pieces that are unique and personal.